Hello, welcome to the SEO4 report. It's my great pleasure to present at this third SEO4 summit the state of affairs of the SEO4 ecosystem. We had a few highlights. The most stunning ones or most significant ones is A, we created the SEO4 Foundation. Um, obviously, there is another talk by June and Tronic on this, so I will not say much about it except that it is a very major milestone in the history of SEO4. And the second really important milestone of the year was that we completed the functional correctness proof of the SEO4 kernel for the RISC-V processor architecture. That means we now have three verified processor architectures for SEO4. It's the 32-bit ARM architecture, the 64-bit Intel architecture, and now the 64-bit RISC-V architecture. Definitely a real milestone uh, with more to come. So what else happened during the year? Well, we set up an interim endorsement scheme for professional services and training. And June will cover that in her talk in, on Wednesday in more detail. Um, we released an SEO4 white paper as an approachable introduction to SEO4 that's sort of at the moderate technical level, understandable for someone with a reasonable computer science background without being an operating system expert. And um, that's been um, pretty much pretty well received in the community, I think. We released for the first year the video recordings of our advanced operating systems SEO4 courses. In the past, we had already made all the other lecture material available, all the slides and as well as the project material, but this time we uploaded the videos on YouTube. And that actually created a really big echo in the social media, much bigger than either the white paper or even the foundation announcement or the um, correct, RISC-V correctness proof. So I'm pretty pleased about that. Um, we have registered the trademark in Australia and the US. The US is still the actual paperwork is in progress, but it's been approved, so that's all good. Um, and we are making more progress on binary verification for RISC-V. So this is closing the gap to, between the C code and the binary executing on the actual hardware. Um, we are making progress on verifying the MCS kernel. I will talk a little bit about the MCS kernel later on. Um, I hope they would be finished, the verification would be finished by now. Unfortunately, it's not quite there yet, but it's um, next few months. And we have a, a core platform specification in draft. I will, I will talk about that on Wednesday. And um, we have a device driver framework that's also uh, going to go out for public comment. Eho has a talk on Wednesday on that one, so please um, attend this. And then we are pushing on on research. So SEO4 is the defines the state of the art, and we're making sure it will continue defining the state of the art. And I will cover that um, our research on what we call time protection in more detail later on in this talk. And we also push on with research on secure multi-server OSs. I'm not going to cover that because it's at the stage a bit too vague. In half a year's time, I feel more comfortable talking about that now. Just a reminder, why are we here? What is SEO for? I should be preaching to the converted, but um, I just repeat it for context because I re need to refer to some of this later on. So SEO 4 is a microkernel, an operating system microkernel, which means it's the, piece, the bit of software that runs in the pr most privileged mode of the hardware. And um, it's a microkernel, meaning that is, this is very small. Everything else is unprivileged and runs on top as user level processes. It is high assurance. That's the whole verification story. It is high performance. It's the world's fastest microkernel. And I'll give you some um, actual data on this. Um, it's the most comprehensively mathematically verified operating system around. And of course, the, the great thing, it's open source, uh, under, published under the GPL v2 license. And why is that significant? Well, it is the best foundation to build safety or security critical systems. And this is what people have been doing for a number of years now. And this is really the reason why we are here, because the summit brings together a lot of these people who build systems on top of SEO4, as well as the people who help others build systems on top of SEO4. We have a um, number of deployments. Many of them we can't 
talk about because they're not yet ready to go public or because um, they're the kind of people who don't want to go public in any case. Um, but uh, safe to say that there's deployments in automotive, aviation, uh, space, defense, critical infrastructure, cyber physical systems, IoT, Industry 4.0, and um, certified systems. So it's a lot, but it's only the beginning. SEO 4 is going to grow much bigger, and the foundation, which June will talk about in detail, is of course a major stepping stone for enabling this growth of the ecosystem. And because I get this a lot, I talked, covered this last summit already, but not everyone was here, so I'll repeat it here. There's a lot of confusion about what the licensing conditions are. SEO4 is open source and it's open source under the GPL v2 license. It's the exact licensing conditions that are used for the Linux kernel as well. But there are significant practical differences here because SEO4 is a microkernel. So what you have in SEO4 is the kernel itself, which is the thing that is verified and which is distributed by the SEO4 foundation in source form with the, by, with the proofs. And this microkernel is under GPLv2, as are the proofs. And besides that, there's also the open ecosystem of system services. So um, various libraries, device drivers, network stacks, language support environments, etc. And as far as they come from us, that is the trustworthy systems group in Sydney, these are generally under the BSD license, so a very liberal license. Okay, now what does this mean? People, many people are afraid about GPL infection. They don't want to be forced to GPL their valuable IP. And there's no, really no reason to be concerned in the case of SEO4 because it's only the kernel and you don't normally modify the kernel. And you should not because if you modify, it's no longer SEO4 and you're not allowed to call it SEO4. The only valid reason to modify the kernel is if you do a platform port. And there is a very little code, typically a few hundred lines that need to be adapted for porting the platform. So typically there is a timer driver, which is actually only used for debugging. So you, you don't actually have to distribute that because it's not used in the production binary. Uh, sorry, the, the a serial driver is not used in the production binary only for debugging. Obviously the kernel needs a timer driver. Um, it typically needs a driver for an interrupt controller, which is didn't explicitly list that here, and then some platform initialization code. This, this is stuff that's part of the kernel, and therefore you need to relicense it under GPLv2. Um, but that's very little. The t what you really typically care about is your application code, which runs in user mode. Um, as application code does, but also you may contribute or produce your own system services. You may have your own device drivers, or you probably will have your own device drivers because um, all SEL4 provides directly is a timer driver, which doesn't go very far. So in general, for your platform, you need to have other device drivers and you may or may not want to open source them. SEO4 does not force you to open source them at all. They can be under any um, license. Same if you have your own file system, your own network stacks, etc. The GPL does not apply to those. You can license those in, uh, under any license you wish. And of course, the system services together with your application code, they are what is their invaluable IP. The stuff you need to do to um, add in the kernel for a platform port is just boring boilerplate stuff. There's no value in there. There's only a cost. And this is the thing that GPL forces you to open source. So it's in, t in terms of IP value, potential loss of IP value, it's a non-issue. Compare that to Linux. Linux has all the system services in the kernel. So the GPL kernel.org source has all your device drivers and your network stacks and file systems and what have you. And in, on top of that, you have your application code. And of course, as in any operating system, your application code it has no licensing restriction, can be anything. But if you do anything to system services in a Linux uh, system, add new device drivers, add new um, file systems, etc. That's part of the kernel and you have to GPL that. 
This is a big difference to SEL4 where you can keep that under any license, including propriety. And in your platform port, you have a lot of device drivers, etc., that you need to get the platform running. Again, this could be valuable or not. Um, in Linux, then the kernel, and you are forced to open source them under GPL. So in terms of the IP which you need to open source in the Linux world, there's a fair bit. In SEO4, there's only the boring boilerplate stuff. So really, no reason to be afraid of the, of the GPL. Right, so now getting back to what SEL4 is. Of course, the real, the number one defining thing, the, what makes SEL4 unique is its proof story. It has a set of proofs that go all the way from high level safety and security requirements down to the binary that runs on the silicon. The first one and most important and most expensive one in terms of producing it is this functional correctness proof. So this is that says that the C code that implements the kernel is a refinement, as the mathematicians call it, of the abstract model, which is a different way of saying that the C code implements the abstract model correctly. So in a very strong sense, the implementation is bug free. And this is what we originally, 11 years ago, did for 32-bit ARM processors. Later, we did it thanks to DARPA funding on 64-bit Intel architectures. And now, as I just mentioned earlier, half a year ago, we completed that functional correctness proof for 64-bit RISC-V processors. And then there is the translation validation step which is um, an automated tool chain, which we did originally for also for 32-bit ARM processors and are now in process of completing for the RISC-V architecture. So within a few months, we will have the tool chain go from the abstract model all the way down to binary also for RISC-V. And then there is the security proofs, which at the moment only exist for 32-bit ARM which basically say, say that the abstract model has the right properties. It can be used to enforce security and safety properties you need from an operating system. So in that sense, they are proofs that the abstract model is good in a fairly solid sense. And so there's this complete proof chain and this is what makes SEO4 not, no longer quite unique. There's another um, one or three other operating system kernels that have a similar um, verification story, although only one, at most one of them I would consider a non-toy. Uh, the others are definitely academic toys. Um, SEL4 was certainly the first one, but interestingly, it's still the only verified operating system kernel with a capability-based um, protection model, which is amazing because capability-based protection is crucial for reasoning about security in a system. Why would you go through the effort of verifying a operating system that's not capability-based, where you lack a lot of the horsepower to actually reason about the security of the system? Beats me. SEO4 is the only one that has it. So this already makes SEO4 unique. But then the other thing that's also unique is it performs very better than any other comparable system, verified or not. And this is not no longer just my claim. I always knew it, and I had, inf I had hard information about this, but I couldn't actually talk about it because a lot of that was under ND obtained under NDA. But recently, some colleagues of mine in the operating system community have actually done some comparable um, com comparative evaluations of performance, which um, I'm very grateful to them. I didn't ask them to do it. They did this on their own, of course, not just to be nice to us and SEO4. They had their own reasons for doing it, but it is an independent evaluation of performance. They only evaluated against open source kernels there because that's what they needed to do the work. Um, so the, the ones they compared it against is Fiasco, which is another L4 kernel uh, from Germany and Circon, which is the new um, Google microkernel. And the numbers here are 
latencies in cycles of IPC round trip operations cross address spaces. So this is a smaller is better, much better. And you can see that SEO4 is about a factor of two or three faster than Fiasco and about almost a factor of 10 faster than Zircon. And there's one interesting story. So the, the first two lines are from two papers, one published this year, the other last year. And uh, the last one is the, the line you get when you look today or at least a few days ago um, on the SEO4.Systems website, the benchmarking site there, and you get a lower number. It's close to the, what, the first one from last year's paper, but uh, significantly lower than the one from this year's paper. Turns out when those people did the work, they grabbed the, um, our kernel as it was last December. And as we reconstructed later, looking at this data, we had a temporary performance regression in December last year, which took about a month or two to get noticed. Um, obviously, there is something wrong with our regression testing. We test for functional regressions, but we don't systematically test for performance regressions. So this one slipped through for a while, and they happened to take the kernel right at that time. But the interesting story, even though we had a 50% performance degradation at that time, it was still a factor of two faster than the fastest other kernel. So um, this means in terms of performance, we have a fair bit of leeway. And you may ask, okay, there's a lot of other microkernels around, commercial ones, non-open source ones. How do they compare? Well, I don't have any hard numbers. People don't let, let me benchmark them. But I do know from um, people who did do comparative benchmarks, all these other systems um, that are sold for safety critical systems typically, their performance is closer to Circon than to SEO4. So they're about an order of magnitude slower. Pretty significant. So SEO4 is still the world's fastest microkernel. And it's the world's fastest and it's the world's most highly assured and it's open source. Why would you bother with anything else? I don't know. Um, the sources are here if you're interested what those papers exactly are. So you can go to them and read up yourself. Okay. So with all this great stuff, why aren't we done? Why are you still working and developing SEO4? Well, there's some good reasons. One is that we sort of, as we build more systems on SEO4, we learn a little bit more and we learn about how, how we can tweak the API a bit to support a bit of a wider class of systems. The most significant change of this sort is the MCS kernel, which is um, close to stabilizing. Um, but be besides that, we actually have some really open problems still. They're not open just for SEO4, they're open for everyone. And basically it comes down to temple isolation. So what, the, what our proofs for SEO4 show is correctness and security enforcement in terms of spatial isolation. So basically memory security and uh, things that are memory-like. Our proofs right now say nothing about time. They, they're timeless, if you like. And therefore, they cannot really reason about temple isolation. And this is the open thing we are actively working on. So what's the issue here? The issue is that you get interference between programs. If you don't have memory protection, you get interference spatially. And this is what SEO4 provably prevents. But even with memory protection, you can have temporal interference. Basically, one process executing, interfering, or influencing the speed with which another process is executing. And this has, there's, that produces problems. There's two kinds of issues here. The one is a safety issue. The timeliness can be impacted. So if, if you have a mixed criticality system where something of low criticality is executing and through its execution influences the execution speed of the high criticality subsystem, this could lead to forcing the high criticality system to miss its deadline. So that would be a temporal integrity violation. And that is what our MCS kernel addresses partially. The, the story is not complete yet. We need to build on top of that. But the MCS kernel is a big first step towards preventing this um, integrity violation through temporal interference.
And the other side of the story is a security story, namely confidentiality violation. And here the thing goes the opposite way. A highly secure component executing, doing its job normally, and through its execution, ex, uh, influencing the execution speed of something of lower security classification. And that represents an information leak and therefore a confidentiality violation. There is no system, as far as I know, that has a complete, real, a really complete story on this. The closest you get is systems using very strict time and space partitioning, um, which, has, which means very inefficient, inflexible scheduling um, that basically mimics uh, physical isolation. But even in those systems, if someone let me play with it, I'm fairly sure I would produce um, security uh, confidentiality violations as well. So this is, this is a unsolved story, not just for SEL4. And we are working on solving this with what we call time protection. And I'll talk about that later. But first, let me talk a little bit about the MCS kernel, which um, addresses the safety or uh, integrity aspect of temporal interference. So, one of the fundamental things is that the MCS kernel extends the capability system to time. So, capabilities are in SEL4 what is used for determining access controls. They are keys that uh, give you the right to access a resource. And in SEL4, capability protection extends comprehensively to everything that's sort of spatial um, in the sense of sort of system resources that are not, have nothing to do with time. So memory, um, execution threats, address spaces, communication endpoints, interrupts, etc. We have a complete capability system and that's part of the verification story. What the MCS model does is extend that capability protection to time. And um, it does that by introducing a notion of scheduling objects. It is one of the first um, systems that is real -time hard real-time capable that uses capabilities for time protection. There's been um, capability models for time before, going back to um, two, three decades in some cases, but they were generally not geared towards hard real-time systems, which is what we aim to support in SEO4. The only other system with um, capabilities that is designed for hard, supporting hard real-time is the composite system from Washington University. And I realize we have a talk by Gabe Palmer there. Um, so this is his system. He beat us by about a few months, basically one conference earlier. Um, but it, it's concurrent work. And um, I realize Gabe's talk is actually about a critique of the oh, MCS kernel, which I know there is warts there, which we are work, working on resolving, and that is work in progress. I haven't s been able to see Gabe's talk by the time I'm recording this, so I don't know exactly what he's going about, but I have some reasonable ideas. So it will be an interesting analysis to watch. So I, re I definitely recommend you watching this. Um, certainly I will. <laughs> Okay, to get back to our MCS kernel, what does it do? We have, basically, we're changing the way we are describing scheduling in the system. The old L4, SEL4 kernel, like other L4 kernels before, had two scheduling attributes, the priority and a time slice. And we replacing the time slice by a more, if you like, a generalization of time slices called a scheduling context. And so, Every thread now, instead of a time slice, has a capability to a scheduling context. And a scheduling context is a first class object that encapsulates the right to access CPU time. So other capabilities provide the right to access, say, memory or devices, etc. These um, scheduling contexts, they provide access to CPU time. And what the scheduling context is basically there's a few other attributes, but the two core ones is a period and a budget. And what it says is that over any time that is 
less than or equal to the period, the thread may no more that may consume no more than its budget in CPU time. So this limits the CPU bandwidth. And so what you can do is you can give different processes, different scheduling contexts. For example, here we have a at the left a scheduling context that has a period of three time units and a um, budget of two, so it is allowed to consume up to two thirds of CPU time at a fairly rapid rate. And then we have another one which um, has a period of a thousand time units and a um, uh, budget of 250. So this is allowed to consume up to 25% of CPU time. And in typical rate monotonic scheduling, you would give the um, one with a shorter period a higher priority than the one with a longer period. And this can represent, for example, in an um, autonomous system, the the, the lower rate with a long period is the control loop, which runs at basically human time scales. And the higher rate could be something like networking, which needs to respond very rapidly. The cool thing here is, even though the lower rate uh, process might be the more critical one that needs to, uh, under all circumstances, meet its deadline, you can allow it to be preempted by something of higher priority, but your, the scheduling context ensures that it doesn't consume more than a certain amount of CPU time and leaves over enough to run the critical bit to its deadline. And in this case, that would be possible. So it, in, if these were the only two processes in the system, we can guarantee that both will always be able to run to their full budget. But you can't overrun. In particular, if this high priority thing is untrusted because it's a complex device driver, doesn't matter. The system will stop it from consuming more than its budget. All right, and so we ensure that there is enough time available for lower priority threats. And um, one of the cool things that this model allows is what we, it's a principal way to do time donation. We had time slice donation earlier, SEO 4 kernels, it was fairly unprincipled. This does it in a principled way. So if there is a sh server that's shared between different clients, they can be at different criticality. Um, then when the one client invokes the server, it passes along its scheduling context to the server. And the server now runs on the client scheduling context. And so the time the server uses is charged against the client. And um, that ensures correct accounting of time in the system and allows us to have this uh, support this mixed criticality system. It's a relatively simple concept, but it's very powerful. And so this was published two years ago. So in summary, the MCS kernel, it fixes up a lot of other things. It enables us to do mixed criticality systems, but it actually solves a lot of problems that were ongoing with SEO4. And so even now, before it's um, quite finished verification, please, please use it for any new work. Don't use the legacy system. Um, you just It forces you into workarounds which you don't need to do in the MCS kernel. So this is the, the future of SEL4, use it. Um, verification, as I said, is getting close. Uh, I was really hoping we would be done by now, but we are not quite. Um, so we need to wait a few more months, but uh, it'll happen really soon. Okay, now back to temple isolation. This was the integrity aspect, which is important for safety of real-time system. And now the confidentiality aspect, which is the, the security aspect for secure systems, um, which as said, we address by what we call time protection. So let's look at what time protection means. So. In order to understand that, we need to understand the source for this interference. And this temporal interference where the execution of one process affects the execution speed of another process is in the end a result of competition for shared hardware resources. So both use the same hardware resources, in particular caches, and therefore they interfere. So by the, if the highly secure process is executing, it uses the cache, it generates a certain cache footprint, and the low, um, when then the low security process is executing, 
um, tries to access the cache, establish its cache footprint, and sometimes it will find locations that it's still in the cache from its last execution, sometimes not. So the residency of its data in the cache is affected by the execution of the other process, and this is where we have an information leak. So it's an inter-process interference from microarchitectural features. Microarchitectures, because they're not defined in the instruction set architecture, they're hidden from the abstraction provided by the hardware software contract. And this is what makes them difficult. And so the Spectre and Meltdown attacks, they are all consequences of this kind of uh, resources. So if we can eliminate this kind of resource contention, then, for example, Spectre becomes impossible. But the problem is that the resources that are the source of these effects are hidden by the hardware software contract. And I'll come back to that. That's a real problem. Um, so our solution is what we call time protection. We call it time protection because it's the temporal equivalent of memory protection. Memory protection is for spatial resources. Time protection is for temporal resources, which is CPU time. Um, and because the interference results from sharing, time protection prevents the interference by preventing sharing. What does that mean? So you have these three processes. They share this common microarchitectural hardware feature, some form of a cache. And we stop the um, interference by partitioning the hardware state. And there's two ways to do it. We can either do spatial partitioning. Um, and I'll tell you in a second how that works. And that works for some kind of caches. and um, it doesn't work for typically for on-core resources. So these are the L1 caches, the TLB, the branch predictors, and prefetches, etc. Because they typically the hardware doesn't really provide the means to partition them in the first place, and because they're indexed by a virtual address which is outside the OS control. The alternative you need to use for these kind of resources is um, temporal partition, also known as multiplexing. So we do secure multiplexing of these partitions. And the security means we have to reset their state to a defined state whenever we hand them from one partition to another. So on a context switch or switch of security partition, we need to reset all these shared hardware support, uh, resources which we temporarily partition. And that's fine for some resources, but again, it doesn't work for all of them. For example, if you have a cache that is shared between multiple cores, like typically the lowest level cache in a system, then flushing helps you nothing because the accesses are concurrent. The bottom line is we need both. So time protection needs to provide both spatial as well as temporal partitioning. OK, how does spatial partitioning work? Some hardware, some processes have specific hardware support for that, but all of them have a inspecific, if you like, hardware support, which is associative caches. Because of the way lookup of data works in a cache using what's called an associative lookup, um, that basically means when looking for something in the cache, its address is used to map to a certain region of the cache. And that means that certain data, can only live in certain regions of the cache. And these cache regions basically can be mapped onto memory, and they're called cache colors. So a certain pages can only live in the yellow part of the cache. Well, that means implicitly we all the pages that can live in the yellow part are the yellow pages in the system. And uh, the other section is the blue part of the cache. So it maps to all the blue pages in the system, etc. So this is what's called uh, page coloring. And if we color our processes, so the high process gets only red colored pages. The blue process only gets only blue colored pages. And it's really frames, physical memory I'm talking about here. If you do that, then this cache, they cannot interfere in this cache because all the high process data can only live in the red part of the cache and the low processes data can only live in the blue part of the cache. And there's no interference possible. Okay, so that's okay. It's easy to do with user level data. Um, 
you can do that in any system, but that's not where the sharing ends because you have operating system data. For example, um, things that describe processes and threats, page tables and threat control blocks. Um, in Linux, you'd be pretty much stuffed here. In SEO4, no problem, mate, because in SEO4, all these things are under user level control. The data, the kernel doesn't allocate its own data after its own data structures after it booted up. Everything it uses, and in sort of metadata like page tables, etc., a user level process actually needs to explicitly hand to the kernel. And that means by starting off the system with all user land partitioned by colors, the kernel data structures implicitly get partitioned as well. You don't need to do any changes to the kernel, you can just do that. Wow, don't tr try to do that in Linux, you won't. So we automatically uh, color kernel dynamic memory by using this partitioning of user data. Then we need to do one more thing because we still have the kernel image that's shared. We, have, we use what we call a kernel clone to create a new kernel image that is also in colored memory. And then each partition has its own kernel image and everything is colored, including the kernel. There's a few exceptions. There's a few small amount of static data that the kernel needs for um, coordinating these images that's still inherently shared that needs special handling. But that, it's very little in SEO4. It's a few, it's I think it's a, it's a couple kilobyte of data, something like that. Um, very easy to handle explicitly. Okay, so this is the static, uh, the, the spatial partitioning. How does the temporal partitioning work? Well, it's actually fairly straightforward because as I said, you just need to flush on the context switch. So th this is our context switch that switch happens to switch security domains. We switch the user context, whatever that means in the operating system, then we reprogram a timer and then return to user, okay? And now in order to do the time protection, we must remove any history dependence in the hardware state. And we do that by flushing this on core state. Okay, there's a problem here because that flush depends on the state itself. For example, if you flush the data cache, then the time this takes depends on how many of the how many cache lines are dirty as opposed to read only. So that's a new dependency, execution history dependency, which we need to get rid of. And we do this um, by padding. So we know what the worst case flush time is. And then we just start, before we do this, we start a timer and then we just pad the time until um, the worst case. And then we know that this any history depends in the flush time is absorbed. There's still a problem because after this, then we need to execute a little bit of code, just a few instructions touching a very little bit of data. And that could be in the cache or not. And that again would introduce an indeterminism, which could be used as a channel. And we've demonstrated that. And we get rid of that by carefully prefetching all of that in the L1 cache. And then we know the exit code is completely deterministic. All right, so we try to evaluate this. And um, we do what's called a prime and probe attack, which is a standard attack in timing channels. You have a Trojan on the high side, which encodes a data into its um, access of the shared hardware. And then we have a spy that observes its own execution time and that way it tries to read the data. So the, the way it works is the uh, spy first fills up the whole cache, then um, lets the Trojan execute, which is, modulates its footprint according to the data it's trying to send and then the spy um, traverses the cache again and measures its execution time that's the output signal and we represent this as the channel matrix this is a channel matrix for the dcache channel on a x86 platform and what the channel matrix means is it is a representation of the conditional probability of observing an output signal giving a certain input signal the output signal is the execution time of the spy. The input signal is the cache footprint of the Trojan. And um, it's represented as a heat map. So yellow means high probability, dark means low probability. And because of that, if this conditional probability of a certain output value depends on the input value, 
which means if there's a variation of color along a horizontal cut through the uh, graph, then we have a channel because then the spy can, from the output um, value, determine with high probability the appropriate input value. That's a channel. And um, if we do that, apply time protection, then the channel is gone. There's just random noise left. Seems all good. Well, it turns out not so. Because if you look at all the possible channels, we find some ones that are problematic. So this is again an Intel platform on the branch history buffer, which I don't think will go into what it is. It's a one bit channel in this case. And the unmitigated, you see it's a very strong channel. Mitigated, well, it, on first glance, it looks like the channel is gone. But if you really look carefully, then there is actually a discontinuity. So there, there is a change on the horizontal line and therefore a small channel. And this is flushing everything you can, everything the hardware lets you do. The channel remains. This is not just an issue with Intel. We do the same thing on the NARM platform, again, the branch history buffer. And you can see, in this case, it actually a much bigger channel than on the Intel case. We did a uh, systematic study of this and found, well, um, there's channels, remnant channels on every, on every processor we looked at. So it's a general problem. So what do we do? Give up? Well, we get risk five to the rescue. So risk five is awesome. It's a great match to an open source kernel. It's an open source, it's an open architecture with open source implementations. For example, the ETH processor from, uh, uh, the Ariane processor from ETH Zurich. And we took that one and implemented, we extended the hardware software contract by saying there's an operation that guarantees you there's no shared state left that has a non-fixed value. And using that, we can, again, here's a, the BHP channel on the Ariane, we can completely get rid of the channel. The little patterns you see here, they're random. If you run the same experiment again, they're in different places. So there's definitely no channel. Awesome. And um, we did that, we did a complete study and found, yes, this actually works. We get, get rid of all the channels. And I'm very actively working in getting this specified for the RISC-V architecture. There's the right way to do time to do it. They're just talking about cache management operations. And there's a lot of support. So this will get into the RISC-V architecture. And then we will have a conformant architecture that allows us to completely eliminate these timing channels. OK, but this is SEO4. Just eliminating them. Is that good enough? You want to have proof, right? Because we prove things in SEO4. How can we prove this? What does it mean to prove time protection? Well, it means that assuming we have hardware that, ha that um, observes a suitable contract and we have a correct formal specification of this hardware, can we then prove that there's no channels left? And I think we can. What, does, what needs to be done? So in the case of spatial partitioning, which is uh, the cache coloring, we need to prove that no domains share the same cache space. So that means we need an abstract model of the cache um, and then reason about what this coloring actually means and that it really properly partitions the cache between those security partitions. The nice thing is this I didn't talk anything about time, right? This is a purely functional property referring to, to hardware state. And that's awesome because that means our existing machinery works. The reason this works is because we're able to convert timing channels into storage channels by relating them to specific microarchitectural hardware state. So that's a powerful idea that will allow us to verify this. How about the temporal partitioning? Here we need to prove that this switch procedure actually does its job. So we need to prove that all non-partitioned hardware is flushed. This is where we need the hardware software contract to ensure that the hardware actually provides that. Um, and then we need to model that um, the state, in order to do that, we need to model this stateful hardware and reason that it's flushed at the right times. And in general, that needs 
for in Intel and ARM, that means we need to have a model of an idealized hardware. With our, our Ariane, we can actually use a model of the real hardware. Awesome. But again, this is a purely functional property, which means our machinery works. And then we pr need to prove that um, this access is deterministic, so the, the prefetching actually is done correctly. That's a bit tricky, but it's also a functional property, so in principle we know how to do it. The tricky thing is actually the padding, which it looks pretty innocent and simple, but this is where time comes in in a more explicit way. And we can still do that by using an abstraction of clocks. So instead of reasoning about time, we reason about abstract clocks and how they relate to this padding. And there is some external reasoning required to do that, but it can be done. In the end, we need to then sh prove that the padding loop terminates as soon as the clock reaches a certain value. And that's again a functional property and therefore doable. So where are we? Um, we've done a fair bit of background work on this. So we published our analysis of the hardware mechanisms or the, right, the failure of hardware to provide the right mechanisms that won the best paper award. We published the design and evaluation of time protection in a simple, uh, in basically a prototype. Um, we published how we're going to go about the verification. And also we published the work on putting this right mechanisms into the RISC-V processor. What we're working on at the moment is to then do the verification. Um, we've done a lot of the work already, including moving this student prototype into something that is more reasonable experimental version of SCL4. And um, we need to still work on the system model and we work on the verification, but we've done a lot of the groundwork for that already. We've already done fun confidentiality proofs for flushing on very simplified hardware models. Um, we haven't done the prefetching proofs and then we need to refine this down to a more realistic hardware model. And I guess within a couple of years we will be there and we'll have a proof that on the conforming processor SEO4 prevents timing channels completely. And with that I'm finishing and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>